It's always sad to come to this last evening, isn't it? <laughs> we have so much, so many memories together. We've enjoyed a beautiful weekend. And as we come to this last day, even though others are waiting and we're anxious to go, but the time goes by rapidly, we never know if the next time we will have this opportunity, we'll be in heaven together. Well, we, we leave that in God's hands. But we're looking forward to that day, and tonight we're going to be talking about that. Even though it's called a departure, we're departing earth, but actually we're coming home. It's actually, we could call it the homecoming. And uh, there's beautiful stories of what God has done in the past to bring people together. And one of my favorite stories is right after the Second World War, uh, there was a soldier, that um, a Hungarian soldier, that was called off to war when he came home. He found nobody at home. His wife was gone. His house was in a, somebody else was living in his house. And he asked the neighbors. The neighbors said, well, we just moved here too. We don't know. All the houses were empty. We just moved into a house. Nobody remembered his family. Nobody remembered him. And so after several years, nearly f four years of looking for his family futilely with no, with no success, he decided to immigrate to New York. So he moved from Europe to New York to start a new life. He gave up all hope of finding his family, and he moved to North America. And he didn't speak any English. Hungarian is not an easy language. It's not based on any of the uh, languages that are Germanic or, or uh, Latin-based. And so he was having a hard time with English. And so he bought a Hungarian newspaper, and he was reading to the newspapers. And he got a, a small job, and he would go back and forth on the bus and he would read his Hungarian newspaper, which is about the only thing he could do. We put that story aside a second, now we'll go to another story. There was a pastor that was pastoring in New York, and, and he also uh, was aware of all the European immigrants coming after the war. And he would try to work with these uh, European immigrants to for, try to find them jobs and try to locate them, and there was a lot of pain and moving to a new country without having anything. And so uh, one of these days, as he was leaving to go to work, the Lord impressed him not to go the normal route, but to go a different route. And so he got on the bus and took this different route. And he sat next to a man that was reading a Hungarian newspaper. He looked over his shoulder, and he couldn't understand the word. <laughs> so he said in a, a few words, he goes, do you speak English? Little. And, but enough to let him know. And he goes, I'm pastor. He introduced his name, introduced, him, introduced himself. And then as they were talking, he found out that this gentleman had moved from Hungary and he was starting a new life. And after the war, and he asked if he had family, he said, I used to have a wife. I lost her. I don't know what happened to her, if she's alive or she's dead. What was her name? Her name was Maria. And, and so he told him about his wife and how he'd prayed that God would restore them, but he'd never found any leads. So that he'd moved to New York, and now he was starting a new life there. And the Lord would help him to heal. As the pastor heard the story, he began to see something and understand something which he had not understood before. Then he understood why God had put him on that bus. So he said, would you have a few minutes to help me with something? I need you to help me. And the man said, yes, I can do that. Well, we need to get off at the next bus stop. And I want you to please come with me because I need your help. And so they walked together. The, the man was a little disconcerted why he would get off the bus with a strange man who said he was a pastor. But he asked for help. So he walked with this man a few blocks. And then he came to an apartment building, and he said, I, I work with immigrants, and I have quite a few in my church. And I, you speak Hungarian, so I need you to help me with translation, please. He pushed a button, picked up the phone, and he said, hello, this is your pastor talking. Could you please help me? Translate. I have a man here that doesn't speak very good English. 
you speak Hungarian. Would you kindly speak to this man and talk to him? She said, of course, Pastor, I'm happy to. The next voice he heard was Maria, his wife. <laughs> the pastor who wrote the story said they just cried and cried and cried and cried, and they, they never would separate themselves after that. They'd go grocery shopping together. They wouldn't dare leave, let each other out of their sight <laughs> because they'd suffered so much from separation. And I think of that story of the homecoming story, how the angels must have worked to pull those pieces together. And I think of what they're doing today to bring God's people together. Very, very soon, it will be homecoming time. Can you imagine all the people that have been torn from their families that will be restored together again? What a beautiful day that will be. Jesus himself can't wait to sound that trumpet. He's coming with a silver trumpet in his left hand and a scythe in his other hand. And when he sounds that trumpet, the dead in Christ will hear that. They will come out of the oceans. They will come out of the caves. They will come out of anywhere that a, a good rec a record has been perfectly kept of who are his children and where they're at. And he's going to bring them forth. That's going to be a beautiful morning and it's going to happen very soon. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. We don't want to miss it. Amen. Under any circumstance, we don't want to miss that morning. Amen. And I want to be part of that event, and I want to be there when, when, to watch the faces. But we don't know. We can't even imagine. Maybe some of us can imagine being torn apart by violence, being torn apart. Many of us have lost loved ones due to illness, sickness, accident, possibly. But... To think of the ages past when people were arrested and they never saw their loved ones again, where they were taken off. Recently, uh, I read a news article that in, um, in uh, the country of Spain, they dug up some remains. And they were just in different positions. Just, uh, they weren't buried of any kind. They were just thrown on top of each other. And they went back to the records and they looked and they, disc they found out that was, the, that was the garbage dump for the Spanish Inquisition. And they knew clearly that these people probably had, been, had died in prison or through torture and they just threw them on the dump. Not even buried, not even the courtesy, just throw them out on the trash heap and let them... Let them uh, deteriorate, their bodies deteriorate right there. They were people that had families. They were torn from their families and they died. 30 million approximately is the number that is given for those that were killed during the Spanish Inquisition. In Peru was one of the headquarters. In Colombia there was another headquarters for the Spanish Inquisition. And, and if you go to those countries you can find where they, where they used to keep them. Places under the cathedrals are filled with bones today. And as you look down there, I, they, they give you a tour. And as you tour, they will show you this is the burial ground of the saints and this is the burial ground. It had nothing to do with burial grounds. And you can find, if, if you take your flashlight and you get out of the beaten path and go in the back, you will find dungeons filled with many, many bones and skeletons of people who were just thrown down there to rot. Every one of them is recorded in the sacred book. And they are to be restored with their families. We can't even imagine. We cannot imagine. But that's going to be a beautiful day. And we have the privilege of being there. If God allows us to live until that time, because it's, it's going to be within our lifetime. A normal lifetime is coming so soon. The events clearly indicate that we're even at the doors. Would you agree? Amen. We are even at the doors. As we discuss that beautiful event, and as, as we discuss what part we will play and what decisions we will make to be there and to make sure others are there, would you bow your heads with me as we ask God's presence? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a blessed weekend we have had. But now we're coming, Lord, to the very last meeting together where we are going to discuss the homecoming.
the departure from this earth and arrival into our new home. Lord, it's a beautiful message. It's an exciting message. It is something that we long for, something that you long for more than even what our, our brief, our understanding is so limited compared to yours and that beauty that you know will be, uh, that you will bring with you. So therefore we ask, Lord, that you will help us to comprehend better. Teach us today. Speak to our hearts. Help us to understand. Tell us what you want us to do. And most of all, we pray that your Holy Spirit will speak clearly to our minds and that your holy angels will surround this house and that all other worldly influences and evil influences will be removed so that we can clearly hear your voice. This is what we plead for. This is what we ask for. This is what we thank you for. In the all-powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. There is no doubt that if you suffer persecution, that the resurrection will mean a very special, uh, will be a, hold a special place. If you've had loved ones taken away, loved ones that have been murdered, loved ones that have been, uh, that have been removed from your home never to see again, the day is coming when you will be restored. It's very special. And Apostle Paul was talking to many, many thousands of Christians that had suffered persecution. And when he's talking to the Thessalonians, he says, in verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 13, he says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not even as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of an archangel and with a trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. He's talking to people who who have been ripped apart by persecution. People have had that have had loved ones killed, burned, thrown to the lions. I cannot even imagine what it would be like to be. I was in a coliseum, and I could only imagine what it would have been like. And then, when I was preaching in Rome, they took me. Then after the coliseum, they took me. To, to the, uh, the great uh, horse races in front, Circus Maximus, they call it, the great circle that is right in front of Nero's house, where they used to set up the crosses, put Christians on them, light them on fire, and use live burning Christians as a light to light up the horse races. I went out in that night and I knelt down in the middle and I gave my heart to the Lord. I said, Lord, in this place, thousands of my brothers and sisters died, killed, murdered. They gave their life and you were with them. You held their hand at that time so that they would bravely endure until the end and receive the crown of life. But Lord, I haven't suffered compared to that. I haven't suffered anything. We think we sacrifice. We haven't sacrificed anything yet. In comparison and so Lord I want to dedicate my life until Jesus coming or be faithful unto death if that is your will to join my brethren until you come I remember that that prayer and I hope I will never forget it the promise that Jesus made is that if he went he would come back again and prepare a place for us the question is during this last generation our generation, what do we do to prepare? What does God want us to do? How can we be ready and how can we be of maximum use to God's mission on earth? That is a question that we have because Satan has had 6,000 years to perfect his, his uh, deceptions. He, did, he, he didn't start with experience. He had to learn. And he has learned, and his deceptions are much, much more deceiving today than they were 6,000 years ago because he's had experience to work with mankind. 
And so one of the things that Satan has discovered is to use truth mixed with a little error. Today, false preachers, false prophets abound in which they preach truth mixed with error. It's very deceptive when you have truth, truth, truth. And it's interesting to note that when Jesus moved into the most holy place, God's people were to move with him into the most holy place and participate and understand what he was doing for them and work with them in that process of, of allowing him to perfect the people that could stand in that last day. Now, evidence is very, very important. When, when, you, when you lay down evidence, if it can be proved to be defective, all of the evidence is thrown out. And Jesus is preparing his closing evidence, his closing arguments. And he's going to lay them down and say, this is, these are my people. I present them as the last closing evidence to my arguments in the great controversy. All Satan has to do is to prove one of those to be defective. I have a story, a CD that I have in the office of a young man who grew up in a home not knowing that his grandfather had been, had been involved in the mafia. His father died. His mother was raising him very protectively to protect him from, his, from the past of his family. But he got involved with some friends and he began to, to steal and to assault some small stores. One day he, he assaulted a small store. They stole the cash. They took a few things and uh, they thought that nobody knew who they were. But the next day somebody showed up on their doorstep. And, and the mother was trembling. They said, we would kill your son for breaking into our store and for stealing and assaulting. But out of respect for his grandfather, we will not do anything to him. But he must not touch our stores again. And so then he told his mother, my grandfather, out of respect for my grandfather, who are those people, mom? <laughs> that was the mafia. He came from an Italian family. That was the mafia. And what does my grandfather have to do with it? Son, I didn't want you to know anything about your grandfather, but he used to also be mafia. Well, he promptly went to those people and said, how do I join you? The mother's worst nightmare. Well, they took him under his wing, their wings, and it wasn't long before he was the personal assistant to the head uh, of the mafia in Chicago. He was called the enforcer. All they said is, I want that man gone. Boom, gone. That guy over there owes me money. Get my money or else make him disappear. He did all of this and everybody came to fear him. He had money coming from all directions. He had plenty of, of resources. He said, he said I, was, I had pocket money of approximately $40,000 a day for anything you wanted, plus other income. One day, he, he, he saw a little brochure about an evangelical pastor, and he said, this is going to be interesting. I like the subject. I'm going to go see what it's about. He thought it was a big hall. He got there and it was a little, it was a, a double wide humble trailer. He pulled up with his expensive $100,000 car. He went inside. And what he heard about God shook him up. And he went home and he couldn't sleep. And he wrestled with the Lord and wrestled with the Lord. And that very same night, he finally said, I can't take it anymore. He knelt down and said, Lord, I give you my heart. After what I heard today, if you love me that much, I give you my heart. Well, then he had to call his boss. <laughs> he had to tell his boss and his boss said, don't do that. You know what the penalty is. The penalty for somebody who nobody leaves. It's death sentence. And he said, you've been involved. You know my story. You know everything. And if you leave, you have to die. 
I know the penalty, but I've made my decision. Son, I'm sorry, but today I will order your disappearance. I've really loved you as a son. You've done me a good job, but you know the laws of the mafia. Yes, sir. Okay. And he hung up. He knew he was dead. He knelt down and he said, Lord, I, I gave you my life. If it means my death, I'm willing to do it, but I am going to stick with you. But if you can save my life somehow. That day, that evening, somebody gunned down his boss. And his boss died. Nobody knew the inside story and nobody knew what he had done except his boss. So nobody wanted to touch him. And they didn't kill him. But the U.S. government knew what he had done. And the U.S. government wanted him behind bars. So once the protection was gone, the mafia protection, the legal protection and all of that, all of that, that, that entails, the U.S. government went after him. And they pinned him with, uh, they accused him of nearly 15 crimes, murder, extortion, beatings, thievery. You know, they just, they came up with the whole list. And he was guilty of all of them, wasn't he? Of course he was. But they, they came up with all these charges. They arrested him, put him in prison, and it was time for the trial. And he said, I don't have a chance to escape, but Lord, what they're accusing me of, I'm guilty, except I didn't do those crimes they told me. They came up with those crimes. I did not do them, but I'm guilty of the same thing. How can I escape? Son, just leave your case in my hands. So the U.S. government went right down the list, brought in all the witnesses, boom, 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 guilty, and, they, and it came to the end of the trial. There was only, it was the last day, and they had lined up all the witnesses there. I saw him kill so-and-so. I saw him beat up. I was their president. They had everything lined up. Everything was seamless until the last day. And he said, I can never escape. I'll be the rest of my life in prison, Lord. Leave it with me. The last witness. I don't remember his name. Mr. Smith. This week, you testified that you witnessed this gentleman perform a murder. Say it one more time, please. Did you witness that murder? No. What? You said you saw it. L last week you said you witnessed that murder. Yeah, but last week they paid me $10,000 to say that. Today they didn't pay me anything. You can imagine the electricity that went through the courtroom. Every one of the witnesses was was considered invalid. He was found innocent on all charges. And according to US law, you can never charge a man twice for the same thing. He, because of that long list they charged him with, he was found innocent on all of them, so they couldn't find anything else to charge him with. And today he's an evangelical pastor working for the Lord. He says, he said, I worked all week to get enough money to buy some clothes where before I could buy anything I wanted to. Now I have to work on a humble job. But this is the point. The point is you can pr you prove one witness, one piece of evidence to be invalid. It, inv it invalidates the entire argument. And before Jesus comes, he is going to lay down the evidence. The Bible calls them the 144,000. Something interesting about the 144,000, they have certain characteristics. Now, normally we don't associate, normally we don't associate Revelation 3, but I'm going to start with Revelation 3, because the, the, the message to Philadelphia is about the 144,000. It's a very interesting message, and it describes them in the same way. In fact, here is a people that is that has the name of God on their forehead. And there's only one group of people in the Bible that have the, the name of God on their forehead. 
Revelation 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has a key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. That's a, that's a beautiful statement. There's an open door. And no man can shut it. For you have but a little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and they are not, but they do lie. Behold, I will make them to come down and worship at thy feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation which cometh upon the whole world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which you have, that no man take your crown. And here is this special little verse. To him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in a temple of my God. And he shall go in and out no more. And I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is a new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Here is a people that overcomes. Here is a people that, because they overcome, God the Father writes his name, the name New Jerusalem is written on her forehead, and the new name of Jesus is written on her forehead. Now, if we go to Revelation, well, the next time it's mentioned is in Revelation 7. You have a group, the wind, angels, holding the winds of strife until the servants of God are sealed on her forehead. And then you go to Revelation 14, and you have a description of these people. Verse 1, And I looked... And lo, a lamb stood upon a Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. It's interesting, it says, not on their foreheads, in their foreheads, huh? Where is it? Right there. And I heard a voice of him from, as of heaven, as a voice of many waters, as a voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping on their harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts. And the four elders, and no man could learn that song save the 144,000 which were redeemed from earth. These are they which were not defiled with women. They are virgins. These are they which were follow the Lamb everywhere he goeth. They were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouths is found no lie, for they are without fault before the throne of God. It's a beautiful description. And we learned this week that that is impossible for humans to do. You and I will never ourselves be able to achieve that we learned that that kind of perfection have you ever told a lie he that has never told a lie raise your hand and of course you would be lying if you raise your hand <laughs> <laughs> we have all broken god's law in fact that means we're all liars right has, has anybody, now this, let someone ask you to raise your hand. If you've ever taken something that didn't belong to you, raise your hand. Bunch of thieves we have here tonight. I raise my hand, by the way. I'm not looking at you. Okay. Uh, how about, have you ever thought an immoral thought? Some of you are lying while you're not raising your hands. <laughs> so if you have an immoral thought, you're an adulterer, right? According to Jesus? Huh? So we have adulterers, liars, and if you speak bad against your brother or sister, you're a murderer as well. There's nothing in us that can deserve salvation. Especially to, to be able to be, say, in their mouth was found no lie. No. At this point, only God. This is his character. Only God can fulfill this. And that's why we learned in this beautiful message of righteousness by faith, that Jesus lived our life and he puts his life in our stead because he lived day by day, emotion by emotion, temptation by temptation, he lived our life. It's valid for him to place his life in ours because he actually lived it. I was talking to a young man and he was saying, but I have this problem and this problem and this problem. No, you don't. If by faith you accept Jesus' life, you have lived a 
perfect, perfectly victorious life. Me? Yes, because Jesus already lived your life victoriously. Every time you failed, Jesus won the victory. So if you accept it, he gives you his life, and your life is done away with. It's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful gift. It can never be merited, never be gained of works. It is a gift. It's a beautiful gift. And here is 144,000 that received that gift. The interesting thing about this group, be it literal or symbolic, we'll find out someday. It's a small group. It's not the, it's not the majority. It says these are the first fruits. The first fruits are the very first part of the harvest. Hmm? So it's not, the, it's not the, a multitude without number. A, these are the first fruits. And they have the name. Now, it's interesting to note, back in Revelation 3, we read that they also have the name New Jerusalem on their forehead. And in Revelation 21, the New Jerusalem is, this, is described as coming down out of heaven and is as a bride adorned for her husband. In the spirit of prophecy, we are told that after Jesus finishes, every human case has been decided, and he finishes the judgment, the investigative judgment, and he closes it, he steps out, he takes off his garments of a high priest, and what kind of garments does he put on? The garments of a king. And did you know that it's at that point that he is married? He goes to his heavenly father, and he, he officiates in a wedding. Right now he's single. Jesus is still single. The wedding has not yet taken place. Because only after every case has been decided, the number will have been made up. And then he's married, and then his father says to him, Son, go bring home your bride. So when he comes in the clouds of glory, he's coming as a married man. He knows every name. He knows his bride, name by name by name. And he takes his bride and takes her to heaven. Now, what's interesting is, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming uh, here in Australia, when you get married, a wife takes her husband's name? Yeah. Not every country is that way. Uh, but if you take your husband's name, it, it makes a good analogy, because in some countries like Latin America, the, the, the brides still keep their same name. But they're said to belong to, so this would be, my wife would be Rebecca Dirksen of Gates, belonging to Gates. And, uh, but she would still be Rebecca Dirksen. So what's your name? Rebecca Dirksen. But, but in, in, the, in the English system, uh, you, you actually change your name to your husband's name. And apparently that's the way it is in the Bible too. <clears throat> the bride takes the name of her husband. And their name is written right here. The family name, your father's name is your family name. And, and the New Jerusalem as well, describing that this special group of people actually are the bride, or is the bride, this group. Now, let's, let's think about the beauty of this. First of all, God, Jesus has a process to finish, and that's where we are now. This is very important to understand, because we're preparing to go home. Amen. And if we're preparing to go home, we have to participate in the process. This is not done independently of our choices. It is very intimately tied in to the choices that we make day by day. First of all, to accept the gift. Secondly, to allow God to replicate his character in us. That requires our permission. It requires our participation. For example, if you can tell that I'm not a weightlifter in the Olympics. I, I assume that you can tell that easily, right? <laughs> I remember when I was in Peru, uh, when they had the Summer Olympics, was it two years ago? I think almost three. three years ago now. It goes by fast. I guess I've been preaching this for a couple of years. Um, I went into a store, and there was, there was a man getting ready to do the heavy lift. You know, they look like a tree trunk. Right? And there's, there's about four of those bells on here, and four of those on here, and, and when they pick it up, the thing goes, like this, right? That's how heavy it is. I said, no, wait, 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 I don't want to, I want to watch this guy pick up these, these bars. So we waited there, and they have a big belt across here so they don't, they don't rupture anything. And he stood out there, and he picked it up. And a bar went, 
fucking funny. <laughs> Stood up there, and there's a loud applause, and he holds it there for so many seconds, and then he throws it down. I, I can't believe those guys. How do they pick up that much weight? How in the world? And as I was watching there, I wanted to see how well he did. It said, women's weightlifting. <laughs> that he was a her. <laughs> I didn't recognize her. She was so hefty and so big, I thought it was a guy. <laughs> it just looked like a tree trunk standing there. Well, let me ask you, did that person participate in the training to get to the Olympics? Or did some trainer just turn him into that? No, it takes discipline. They have to make a choice every day, every day, every day for years and years and years. I'm going to the Olympics, I'm going to the Olympics, I'm going to the Olympics, whatever it takes, whatever my trainer does, says, that's what I'm going to do. Because if you rebel against the training, you're disqualified. I mean, the trainer is trying to give you an opportunity to discipline, but if you don't self-discipline, no trainer can drag you to the Olympics, correct? We're going to the Olympics spiritually. We have a trainer. He gives us his character. He's willing to train us. He's willing to teach us. He's willing to discipline us, but we have to participate in the training. It's not done independently. That means every day we have lessons to learn. Every day, we have to surrender to our trainer and say, Lord, here I am. You've given me your character. I've accepted it. I thank you. But now that I've given you everything, you have to do in me what you want to be done. I'm sorry that I can't do it on my own, but this is the condition you found the human race in. And you know that already. So thank you for accepting me anyway. We were listening to a sermon this morning with my wife, and it was a very interesting sermon because the pastor pointed out that, that when Jesus was here, all of the sinners felt comfortable in his presence. The prostitutes didn't mind hanging around with him. The, the tax collectors, I mean, robbers and thieves and corrupt, you know, I mean, I live in a corrupt country in South America where they're trying to steal everything from you. And another country we lived in was even worse. Every time you went through and they searched your bag, they would always try to steal something. And if they found something they liked, the other officer would talk to you and say, let me ask you some questions. And then you would turn your attention to the officer while they were stealing from your bag. This happens all the time. And when I lived there, I never lost anything because I would say, no, just a minute, don't bother me. Sir, I need to talk to you. Don't bother me, sir. I'm watching him search my bag. And I would watch every move he made, and he would tap me and say, I need to talk to you. Just a minute, sir. <laughs> then I would go, zip, zip, zip. <laughs> yes, sir, what do you want? <laughs> I knew the tricks. But what they do is they wait, they, let, they search your bag, and they say, this passenger has something. They wait till five minutes before they announce your flight. They take you to the back room to check your bags. And while they're checking your bags, they're saying, final call. Passengers, please board your flight. And the passenger's nervous because he's in a back room and you, they do it on purpose. And then, and then he's asking you questions and asking you questions and you're trying to answer and they're stealing all your things. Okay, these, these are tax collectors. That's what they did. They stole from everybody. And they felt comfortable in Jesus' presence. All the sinners felt comfortable in his presence. But when Jesus comes back, when the sinners see Jesus on that cloud, every face turns black. And they seek to hide from him who is sitting on that cloud. You see, he came, he said, when you see me, you see the Father. You don't see me, you see the Father. But when they see him really, as he comes, as he is, they're going to hide. Because when he comes back, he's not coming back in the same way he came. Hidden. He's coming back this time with, with uh, the reward and the results of, for those that are sinners, their choices. So we have some choices to make, just like going to the Olympics every day. It affects, it affects our diet, 
It affects the way we clothe ourselves, the clothes that we buy and the clothes we put on. It affects the things that we read on the side. It affects the music we listen to. Now, you can say in the Olympics when you're going to Olympics, but I like eating ice cream. But your trainer says to you, but ice cream won't help you to run faster. You need to be on a low-fat diet. You need to have a high-energy, low-fat diet. But I like what I want to eat. Okay, then, don't go to the Olympics. You understand? Your trainer will tell you what to eat. You understand I do that, right? Do trainers tell Olympic athletes what to eat? <laughs> They're on very strict diets. I'm imagining the runners, you know, I've, I've seen... Uh, I've seen Olympic runners um, run, and they're under training, and they're very strict. I remember years ago when the first, the first time in history they had a 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, and 10 on the, on the, Olymp on, on the uh, female, female gymnastics. Her name was a little Romanian girl called Nadia Comaninci. Oh. <laughs> I was watching, and I could not believe my eyes. In fact... In fact, they couldn't even put that many numbers on the There wasn't enough to... Nobody had ever scored perfect 10 before. There wasn't enough digits on the board to put that number on. I guess it was 100. Everybody gets 98, 99, 96, 90. But this girl scored 100 and they didn't have three. And so they were trying to scramble. How do you do that? Well, I can tell you that little young lady took a lot of training and a lot of discipline, but she submitted, she submitted, she submitted. And she scored it. Now, obviously, God gave her natural talents because other people also work just as hard and they don't get 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. But she did her part. The 144,000 are going to get 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. And God's going to lay down the evidence. He's going to say, I close my case. I declare them sealed for eternity. In my opinion, they're ready to go to heaven. And then there's a period of time called the time of Jacob's trouble, <laughs> where Satan gets to say, uh, I would like to cross-examine the witnesses. And then the, uh, the enemy will stand up, and he will try his very, very best to see if he can prove that those witnesses are faulty. That's why it's the time of Jacob's trouble. <laughs> because every one of those witnesses knows the consequences of failing God. One single person fails God, the whole batch is declared to be unfit evidence. You understand in the great controversy, this is the final thing. This is it. That's why we have to hide in God. We cannot do it. I was in Holland the other day and one lady asked me, how can we stand to that time? Isn't the Holy Spirit going to be withdrawn at that time? Oh, no, 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 no. It's only going to be the Holy Spirit that carries us through. Amen. And she was under the impression that we're going to stand by ourselves. Well, it's true, there's no intercessor. But it's going to be the Holy Spirit that's going to be working in your life all the way through. Once the Holy Spirit is total control of you, He will carry you through all the way. God will work His perfect work in you. And what He has started, He will be faithful to complete it. Isn't that a beautiful song? He who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Oh, I love that. It is God who does it. So what is our part? The good news is we can receive it for free. The bad news is that it requires our daily participation. The good news is that if we do it, God will do His part and guarantee us success. There's, there's a chapter in Christian service which I like. It's actually the very, it's actually the next to last chapter. It's called Assurances of Success. Now, this, this is a war manual, by the way. Some of you want to become Christian soldiers? <laughs> you want to learn how to do warfare? I was talking about, uh, here it says somewhere, we must move forward in aggressive warfare. Uh, I was reading this, I was in Austria, and uh, I just said, we must look the work straight in the face and move forward as fast as possible in aggressive warfare. And afterward, this guy said, I'm from Germany. And we Germans, we don't like the word warfare. Aggressive warfare is too harsh. Can you please soften it down? I said, that's what it says. I know, but could you use other words? Because we don't like those words. But that's what it says. Well, I'm asking you, please, not to use those words. 
But that's what it says. <laughs> I can change what what is been written. I'm just quoting, and when you quote, you have to read what it says. Well, in aggressive warfare means you have to be a soldier. You have to learn to say, yes, sir. When a commanding officer asks you to do something, you don't say, let me think about it. Not if you're a soldier. Now, if you're a civilian, you, you have, I have rights. I don't have to obey you. You know, I mean, that's what civilians think. But soldiers don't do that. They're brainwashed. These soldiers, they're brainwashed. That's what they do in boot camp. I went, to, I went to a military camp. I was driving through. I stopped for gasoline, and right there was a big military base. I went into the bathroom to wash my hands, and there was a little time, a soldier there. He was, had no hair. I knew that they'd cut off his hair, you know, I mean, they do that in boot camp. They don't want you to be, they don't want, no hairstyles. You're just a robot. You just obey. You're not unique or anything. You're just another soldier. And so I was washing my hands, and I said, good evening. How are you? He said, fine, sir. At first I thought, that's crazy behavior. Then I realized, no, they just brainwashed the guy. Anybody who's older than him is probably an officer. And to all officers, you say, yes, sir, no, sir. Quick, sir. Absolutely, sir. Huh? They, they have the Marines in the United States that are supposed to be the toughest of the tough. They tell them they can't die. That's what they try to train them. You cannot die. Bullets cannot touch you. Well, they take it for training. And they take him to this place called Paris Island. That's the name of the training place for Marines. And so we went driving through one time. I just happened to be there and I said, hey, have you ever driven through Paris Island? You can drive right through. You can watch them in training and so on. So we went through. And as we were going through, there was one that was a ladies section and then there was a man's section. And as we were driving through, I saw a soldier spit on the ground. And his officer came and screamed in his face. Why did you spit on the ground? Did I give you permission? No, sir. You don't spit on the ground unless I thought you understand, sir. Soldier. Yes, sir. And he can't even spit. And then he said, get down with your mouth, pick it up and take it over there. <laughs> so we had to get down, pick up that dust, pick up the spit, take it over there and spit it out. Have you learned your lesson? Yes, sir. <laughs> That's a little abusive, right? But they teach them harsh training because they're going to go into harsh environments. I understand that some of the special forces even get worse training. I mean, I can't even imagine some. In, in the Navy SEALs, one of the last things they do for training is they, they tie their feet and their hands and they put them in a big pool of water and they put a weight on their feet and they have to go to the bottom and they have to shove up and as they go up, their head comes out of the water, take a deep breath, and they go to the bottom. And then they shove up, and they have to be there for nearly an hour doing this. How to survive in, in conditions where you're tied and on the bottom? I mean, I talked to another Special Forces, this time in the Air Force. And they, they strap on wings. Now, I've never seen these wings, but they're... They're not just hang gliders. They actually strap onto them. Somehow they, they physically attach. But they're gliders. And they give them GPS. They give them communication equipment. And they take them 30 miles out in the ocean from an aircraft carrier in a storm. And they, they jump out of an airplane. And to pass the test, they have to land 30 miles away on an aircraft carrier. How do they do that? They can't glide the whole way, so they have to look for storms. And they go into a storm, and, shh, and, and all the violence of a storm, they go higher and higher and higher, then they glide. They find another cloud, and they go up and up and up, and, they, and eventually they work their way to an aircraft carrier, and they have to land on the deck in the dark. That's the final test. So even Marines training is nothing compared. Well, I'm trying to think, what kind of training is God going to put his people through? Well, thankfully enough, we have a loving trainer. But it's still going to require some severe discipline, and we only have a short time to learn. Some people, you know, take sanctification as a work of a lifetime. Well, brothers and sisters, we don't have a lifetime anymore. And we can be assured of success as long as we let him do what, what he wants. But is it going to be easy? No. It's going to require some discipline. 
It's going to require submission, submission. Dying to self is the hardest kind of death you can die. Commanders and kings have never learned to die to self. And we have to learn to die to self like Jesus. Jesus was totally emptied of self, totally emptied. In fact, in Philippians 2, it says he, he humbled himself. It says he made himself of no reputation, which is an emptying, a total emptying of self. Well, that is really hard for David Gates to do. Where somebody steps on your toes. <laughs> Or somebody talks bad about you and you want to say, what? <laughs> if we're totally dead to self, self cannot react. So therefore, I must not, self must not be dead in me yet. Is self dead in you yet? God has a work to do in us still, right? Yes. And this is by surrendering and surrendering and surrendering. My wife reminds me all the time, David, you need to learn to forgive. David, David, calm down. <laughs> and sometimes I have to remind her we're, we're both we're both in the hands of the Lord and we know he has a work to do but here's assurances of success this chapter is beautiful it says God will do the work if we will just furnish him the instruments if we give ourselves to him he will do the work in us it's very beautiful to everyone who offers himself to the Lord for service withholding nothing uh, there, there is the secret. Withholding nothing is given the power for attainment of measureless results. It's we withhold on God. We actually hold back. Well, Lord, you can have this part. There's a story told. It's only a story, but it illustrates a good lesson of a man who wanted Jesus to come visit him in his home. And he built a beautiful multi-story home and he prepared a room for Jesus. And one day Jesus did knock on his, door, on his door and he led him right up to, Lord, I made this room for you. Look at that. It, it has everything, a view to the outside. It has a beautiful bed, a table, a little office here. Just rest quietly. I'll even bring you your breakfast, lunch, and supper. And Jesus said, thank you. And the man said, rest well, please. And he closed the door. That night there was a knock on the door, a very ugly knock. And when he opened it up, there was a demon at his door. And he wrestled for almost an hour, but he was able to finally close that door. But he was kind of irritated. Here I'm wrestling by, by myself downstairs, and Jesus is upstairs. He didn't even help me. But he didn't say anything because Jesus was his guest. The next night, two demons came. It took him two hours to close the door. Now he was quite irritated. But what really scared him to death was, before the demons left, they said, tomorrow Satan himself will come in. You won't be able to close the door on him. Now he was scared. So he decided to talk to Jesus about it. And he complained and he said, I wrestled the night before last for an hour. Last night I wrestled for two hours. The demons were trying to come in. And I'm, I'm a little concerned because ton tonight the devil is coming himself. And you're just here in the room. You didn't help me. And Jesus said, you know, when you brought me here, you put me in this room and you closed the door. You told me, this room is for you. You didn't offer me your whole house. Now, if you want the whole house to be mine, let me answer the door tonight. But you just gave me this one room. That's all you gave me. And I didn't step out of the room because that's what you offered to me. Lord, he knelt down, confessed his sin. Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. The whole house is yours. Then don't worry, because tonight I will answer the door. I'm now the owner of the house. That night, you could almost smell the sulfur. <laughs> there was a red light coming from underneath the door. <laughs> and the man was trembling. No, no. Peace. I know what to, how to answer the door. Bang, bang, bang! Open the door! Jesus calmly went to the door. He opened it up and said, Good evening, can I help you? And it was Satan himself. Satan took one look at him and said, Sorry, wrong address. <laughs> no fight, no pressure, nothing. Why? Because the devil is not going to fight with Jesus. He lost the battle already. All authority was given into Jesus' hands. But the lesson is clear, isn't it? If you give Jesus a piece of your heart, he cannot win all your battles. You have to give him 
everything, withholding nothing. Does that mean it affects your, your diet? Will it affect what music you listen to? Will it affect what you watch? <laughs> It'll affect everything. And if people say, what? but I don't want Jesus to touch this part of my life. I only want to give him this part. That's called lukewarm, where you mix the hot and the cold together. If you want to, he says, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I wish I, you were cold or hot, but because you are neither cold or hot but lukewarm, I will vomit you out of my mouth. How sad. It's better to be cold than it is to be lukewarm. You will be judged less harshly for being an atheist or for being totally rebellious and out of the church. You will be judged less harshly than saying, I'm a Christian. And in reality, you're not. You do more damage to God. But God doesn't want you to be lukewarm or, cold or hot. He wants you to be, I'm sorry, or cold. He wants you to be hot. Okay, just a few more quotes from here, since it's so encouraging. All the resources, page 259, all the resources of heaven are at the command of those that are seeking to save the lost. How much resources does heaven have? <laughs> all the silver and all the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Haggai 2.8. Okay? Listen to this. All of heaven is an activity, and the angels of God are waiting to cooperate with all who devise plans whereby souls for whom, for whom Christ has died may hear the glad tidings of salvation. All of the angels are waiting for you and me to make plans. What, what are some kind of plans? Well, Lord, I'm going to get together with my neighbor. We're going to pray, and then we're going to make plans to give out literature, to visit those that are hurting, to go to the prison, to go to those that, that need food, to clothe the naked. We're going to make plans to go to the foreign mission field. We're going to make a trip. We're going to take people. Or maybe I'm available. I finished my college education, and I'm available to go for a whole year. And some of you cannot go. You go, I'm available to pay your ticket to go. <laughs> if you will go to that country to work, I will pay your ticket, and I will send you a little bit each month. I can't go, but I will send you. See, you understand, everybody has a part to play. And if you, have, if you can't do either, you can pray, 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 pray. I'll tell you what, my wife and I are so grateful for all of your prayers. We go to places that our lives are in danger all the time. And I have to tell you that we sense God's special protection and we know somebody is praying. Amen. We can meet people everywhere that have never met us before. We pray for you every day. Amen. We are so grateful. And some of you, are on, I know, are the ones that are praying. If you will go, he will put you in possession of the means that you need. Workers for Christ are never to think, much less to speak of failure. We are to give ourselves wholly to God and in our work follow his instructions, and he makes himself responsible for its accomplishment. Not once should we even think of failure. You getting a picture? Failure is not an option. Now, it's, it's not just a, we're going to go to a rugby game. Guys, don't think of failure. Failure is not an option. I know, but when those New Zealanders start jumping up and down. <laughs> I watched it on TV and made me scared. <laughs> I know it's only an act. But, uh, forgive me, but I, 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 it's, it's a, that's their specialty, right? I understand that's one of the things they always do. We are not to even consider the thought of failure because when we work with God, He never fails. Amen. Now, now we're approaching the final events of Earth's history. We have a very short time, a very short time to allow God to get us ready for that time. We must learn in a few months what some people have learned in years. Why didn't we start earlier? Wish we had. <laughs> Wish we had. But it is too late to start earlier. We have to start now. And what does that entail? The first step, which we talked about yesterday, the first step is to accept that beautiful gift. Just recognize that only Christ can live a perfect life. He lived my life. I will never live that life. I cannot live that life. I have to accept it. Secondly, after I accept it by faith, confessing my sins and accepting that gift, 
It is now my job to continue to leave and place my will in his hands every day. Every time I have a temptation, I have to learn to surrender. Not to feel guilty. Oh, Lord, I failed you again. Now what? No, no, no. It never was your life. I already won a temptation. I covered you. But you have to learn some lessons. Now, let me, let, let's, let's imagine a few scenarios. What happens if you don't learn those lessons? What happens if God forgives you and you place yourself in his hands and, and simply over the years, over the months of training, you just never learn to surrender to self? Well, I'll tell you what. If you love the Lord and you surrender and ask him to forgive you, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Amen. But you may not be able to be part of the closing evidence. Why? Because God needs a totally surrendered people for the closing evidence. God needs you. God desperately needs people that he can use for the closing evidence. And you can say, well, I'm going to think about me. I just don't want to go through that much training. It's too hard. I would rather ask God to forgive me and just die. Well, you're not thinking of God, are you? You're thinking of yourself. And I think thinking of self is a sin. You understand, it's selfishness. And selfishness is the root of all sin. So if you're thinking of your needs, then there's something basically wrong in a whole way of thinking. Now, God may ask us to sleep. Just the, the pastor we listened to this morning on the Internet. Somebody sent us a link. We were listening to it. And I said, I'm going to Google him. And so I Googled him. And lo and behold, he was the pastor that just had an accident with his airplane and he got killed earlier this year. I'd heard there was some evangelist that got killed. He lived up in Michigan and he flew in the airplane. And I'm not sure about the weather conditions. They don't give, the article doesn't give too many details, but he crashed and his airplane exploded. And they just buried him a few months ago. God may call us to rest. I don't know why God allowed it. He'll explain someday and we'll realize because God allowed it, more people will be in heaven. Every time God allows something, it maximizes the result. We'll understand someday. We have all eternity to, to, to grow. But on this earth, we don't always understand. So what are the options? <laughs> There's only really one option. We think of God and his needs only. God first. What are his needs? His needs are a people totally surrendered. What's our response? Yes, Lord. That's right. Yes, sir. <clears throat> If you love me, keep my commandments. What is God's commandments? Surrender yourself. Let me do what I need to do in you. But you say, Lord, I want to think of myself disqualified. So we think that we might be able to save ourselves and get, out, get in without any personal training. Sorry to disappoint you. God is calling people to come up to the standard. You can say, Lord, I'm in. And if God sees fit to let you rest, let God decide that. But if you say, but I would rather die without having to go through the time of trouble. Oh, now you're being selfish again. Because God needs people who can stand through the time of trouble. And he will give you the power to do it. Now, if you're already dying of cancer, my mother told me, I am so tired. I think I'm, I'd rather rest and wait for Jesus coming. But not your dad. Your dad wants to be alive and standing there. So she has less energy than my dad. Her body is giving out. And it's true, we get tired. And God understands that. If we're tired, it's not because we're thinking of ourselves, it's just that the reality is our bodies give out. And when your bodies give out, sometimes it's nicer to go to sleep. But let's think of God today. What is God needing? God is needing an army of people. An army that trust him, an army that have accepted his robe of righteousness, an army totally possessed by the Holy Spirit, controlled by God, every single act. And only God can do that. And the Holy Spirit will be poured out to perfect that. It won't happen before. The fruit, the fruit will ripen 
during that latter rain. And he will do his job in us. And it is his responsibility, by the way. And so as we surrender to him, he will do the work. And he will give us assurance of success. And if he says, I want you to rest, we say, yes, sir. And if he says, I want you to stand to the last time of tribulation, we go, in your power, sir. Hmm? Amen. That's the only choices we have. We let God decide for us. We don't decide. Our choice is to say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. That's the only response. And the beautiful thing is, one of these days it'll all be over. And our loving Savior will be vindicated before the whole universe in your life and in my life. So we're thinking of what God needs now. He thought of what we needed, right? He came to this earth. He gave up all his own needs and he lived my life and he lived your life. Why? Because he was thinking of us. Then he says to us, come and follow me. And that's our calling. If we're going to follow him, we're going to do exactly the same. We're going to empty ourselves and let, allow him to live his life in us like he allowed his father to live in him. And he will carry out his will. It's, the response is always the same. Not my will, but your will. Not my will, but your will. Not my will, but your will. That's the response that God is looking for. And so our wills tonight is to honor our Heavenly Father. And whatever he needs us to be, here I am, sir. Send me. Huh? It's a beautiful response. It'll make heaven very happy. And I have to tell you, it'll make, it'll make the enemy very, very scared. Amen. Because when God's people remove every obstacle and allow the Holy Spirit total possession, he knows his time is very, very short. So what is Satan doing? To, what is the enemy doing to try to interrupt God? Let's look at some of the options. I mean, some of the things that's happening. Number one, he's trying to destroy the earth as fast as possible. Scientists today tell us that, that, well, Jacques Cousteau, the famous French scientist, he said the word, the, in his day, before he died, he said the world had a maximum of 40 years to sustain human life. Recently, out of London, or one of the universities in England, they announced, a famous Nobel Prize winner announced the world had a maximum of 30 years to support human life. And now they think it has even less. Why? <laughs> They're doing everything possible to accelerate the process so that this planet can no longer support human life. Through, through uh, natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, everything that Satan can do to interrupt nature so that there's no food, so that there's no water, so that there's no, well, no clean water, there, there, this, everything, no, no healthful food. Did you know that there's some vitamins that they're making illegal? Vitamins are vital. They're required for life. And there are some vitamins they are trying to make illegal so that they never end up in the food. You said, why? They're vitamins. We know why. We're trying to destroy human life. Satan is trying to accelerate the destruction process. And eventually, God will give him more and more freedom until finally after the close of probation, he will have total control, and then we're going to see what destruction really means. The angels are holding the winds of strife. We are told in last day events that the angels will hold the winds of strife until every decision has been made. So that doesn't mean that they're not going to be letting go. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be an increasing progressive letting go. It just means that until every case has been decided, Satan is handcuffed and limited in what he can do. But once every case has been decided, those handcuffs will come off. And you want to know what hell is? You will see it. After the close of probation, hell will be totally in control. And then it will be hell on earth. Now, which side do you want to be on after that? Do you want to be under his control or under God's protection? You don't want hell to be in charge of your life. Not at all. If you want to see terror, put Satan in control of the earth and no Holy Spirit, nothing to stop him. Then we will know what hell is truly like. Now, what's another thing he's doing? One of the things he's doing is rapidly trying to control your conscience. 
the nations are positioning themselves to try to enforce the conscience, enforce it in a certain direction. Other moves are being made to bankrupt the world. It's called a global economic crisis. This is not a natural. It took a lot of work to get there. <laughs> a few people have been working for many, many years to try to place the resources of the world in the hands of a few people. So that most people will go hungry unless they obey. So the economy has been shaped to control conscience. The laws have been worked on all over the world to be able to come to a point where you can control the conscience. It hasn't happened yet, thank the Lord, completely because of the Holy Spirit and the angels are still holding the winds. A few people hold back a lot. Angels, we are told, stand up in the halls of men and speak to issues in order to hold back the wind. We, we don't know who they are yet. Someday we may see them. Right now, we know that God is extremely active in the affairs of men in order to hold the winds of strife. In the United States, they have done everything, everything possible to destroy the economy. Everybody admits that little green piece of paper is worthless. Everybody admits that when economy crashes, every dollar will be worth cents, pennies. Why hasn't it crashed? They are emptying the United States of resources. They are emptying, they've tried everything, they've printed money. In fact, some years ago, the Federal Reserve announced, we will no longer inform how much money we're printing. Before, they would say we printed so much and people could calculate inflation. Well, we've printed so much and it's worth so much and we have so much gold, therefore inflation will probably go up by 10% or whatever the amount that they, the economists figured. But if they don't tell you how much they print, you understand how money works, right? Yeah. If you have twice as much paper for the same amount of gold, the paper is worth half as much. They haven't wrote the gold. Well, they do have some. They, every country has some, but, but it's no longer based on a gold standard. But there is gold, and there's tons of gold. I happen to know there's tons of gold, but it's no longer based on a gold standard. Before, how much gold you had determined how much money you printed. If you got more gold, you printed more money because that paper was worth so much gold. Once they broke the gold standard, it means print all the paper you want. It's no longer linked to a real asset. But here we have an issue. If you print 10 times more paper, you're supposed to, it's supposed to be worth one-tenth. And if you print time 100 times more paper, what is it worth? 1%. But you know what? It hasn't happened that way. They have printed and printed and printed and printed and printed billions a day and paid this and paid that, and the money still holds its value. Economists cannot understand. They have predicted for years. It cannot go on. It's going to crash. And I say, God's tremendous mercy that God holds the winds so that you and I can still move our resources, we can still advance God's work, we can still go to the mission field, offering and tithing still have an impact on God's work. Amen. If money suddenly became worthless, how could God's people finance the work? Hmm? God has a thousand ways we know, but overall it would be very, very difficult to do anything if money is worthless and only 1% has all the money. So therefore, using the economy, uh, there's a health, health, new diseases. Huh? You know that there's new diseases coming out all the time, right? Are you aware that there's no new antibiotics being developed? It takes about 15 years and $1 billion to develop an antibiotic, according to the information given to us from the pharmaceutical companies. We are informed that there's no new antibiotics being developed. They say they have reached the end of their investigation and they just can't develop any more new antibiotics. It's probably not true that they've reached the end, but it probably is true that they're not developing new antibiotics. What does that mean? New diseases are coming upon the earth that have no cure. What for? <laughs> to rapidly depopulate the earth. I don't know what they think they're going to do. Maybe they think they have, maybe they have a hidden antibiotic they think they're going to get away with. I don't know. But Satan is working for ways. In fact, 
we understand more today than we did some years ago. One of the sins that brought the flood was the amalgamation of man and beast. You know what amalgamation means? Mixing of the genes between animals and men. And now we understand how easy that is because all the food is being amalgamated. We can buy vegetables that aren't even 100% vegetables. And, and, and they, have, they have pigs today that have human blood. They can give transfusion directly from a pig into a human. So the pig is not 100% pig. It's partly human. They have done, they have done brain transplants in, 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 in the, in the embryo, embryos. Did I say it right? Embryos, I'm thinking in Spanish. <laughs> embryos, and of rats, they have 30% human brain. They say they hope to someday have 100% human brain so that they can obey orders. <laughs> why, why, why does Satan mess around with rats and pigs and humans? He wants to erase the image of God in mankind. Why doesn't he pick some noble animal? No, he has to pick a pig and a rat. Because he's trying to reduce mankind as fast as possible to the lowest level. And then, and then you look at some of the genetic defects of drugs and radiation and other things and you realize how rapidly he has succeeded in degrading mankind. God in his mercy had to bring the flood or else today you and I would probably not be 100% human. He had to start over with a family from zero in order to protect the human race. It repented him it was so wicked, but he had no choice. Start over. That's all he had. And now we're getting to the point where we're rapidly doing the same thing. Some scientists have said that in the, in the next two or three generations, it will be far hard to find 100% human. Now you see, you see we're accelerating to the finish line, aren't we? We're accelerating to the finish line. So Satan is trying his best to shortcut God's process the time is short. He knows his time is short. And you know what? God knows his time is short too. So how about, how about today making a decision to help God? God needs people who are willing to submit 100% and empty themselves. He needs a people that can take the seal on their forehead of the Father, the new Jerusalem, and his new name. For me, I'm determined I am determined with the Lord's help that I am going to be one of them. If the Lord sees fit to allow me to rest, then I will need to accept. But if the Lord allows me, we are to strive to be among that group. You can't make the Olympics without striving. You have to determine in your heart, I want to be there. And that's what I've determined in my heart. Is that your will also tonight? I know people will be watching this video for many years, and I pray that everybody who watches this, or you that are here, will make that decision every single day. Lord, today, today, live out your life within me. Live out your life within me is a beautiful song. And that's really what it is, that God may do whatever he wants to with us. In the end, we can't protect ourselves anyhow. <laughs> In the end, we have no power to protect ourselves. In vain do you build a city if God doesn't build it, in vain do you protect a city if God doesn't protect it. In vain do we strive to move ahead if God doesn't move us ahead. So what we can do is place our lives into his hands and he will... How many of you actually dream of something in your life? You, you, you still have a dream to carry out in your life. I want to see, if you, I want to see how many hands we have. Young people, you have dreams? Okay, very good. Older people too, right? Yeah. We all have dreams. God gave us those dreams. And the only person that can make those dreams be fulfilled is God himself. So many humans work all their life striving to grab a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that. They seek that dream and they die without ever finding it. But not if you give your heart to God. Amen. I can seriously, honestly tell you that when I was 18, I made my choice. 
I wrestled with the Lord. I was going to accept a job, a job that a Christian would not accept. It wasn't an illegal job, but it was a job that paid well, but not, not a job a Christian would accept. But I wanted money. I needed money. I was studying aviation. I was buying an airplane. I needed cash. And I got a job offer. It paid about, it paid about five times more than minimum wage. And for me, that was a lot when you're a teenager. And that night, God would not let me rest. Wouldn't let me rest. I wrestled with him till about 2 o'clock in the morning. And finally, I said, okay. Okay, okay. I'm going to stop wrestling. That's not what I called you for. I didn't save your life when you were a baby for that. I have a mission for you. Fine. I'm going to accept. I'm not going to take the job. I'll accept your plan for my life. But I want to make something very clear. From now on, from this day, whatever happens to me, is your fault. <laughs> That's what I told him. <laughs> like if it was something bad, right? Your fault. I didn't say, I could have said your responsibility. No, I said, from now on, whatever happens to me, you, it is your fault. Because I'm turning my life over to you. And God said, I'll take it. In my life, I look back till I, since I was 18, and my life is like a straight arrow. I made my mistakes. I've had to apologize. Boom, my, this young lady got a hold of me. Everything lined up. College education, my life partner, uh, the opportunity. Bang, 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 bang. And it, now it's 35 years later. And I, will ne I would not change any major decision in my life. They have been exactly what I have always dreamed of doing. More than I have dreamed. And I can tell you that the dreams you have can only be fulfilled if God carries them out in your life. Assuming they're godly dreams. And God only gives godly dreams. The desires of your heart, He put them there. And He's going to help you carry them out to His honor and glory. So, tonight, I'm looking forward to going home. There may not be another opportunity for me to come back again. Maybe there will be. Only God knows. But the way things are moving so fast, it could be the last time. That's okay, because we have all eternity together. And I hope these meetings have been a tremendous encouragement to you. Please remember, the best days are straight ahead. If you're in God's hands and you accept that free gift, we have nothing to be scared of. The judgment is a good thing, by the way, if you're ready. If you're declared innocent, this is very, very good. In fact, getting a judgment of innocent is a very positive step forward. Not knowing what's going to happen, that's more difficult. Getting a verdict of innocent is very good. And so I would like to encourage you to stay covered every day in God's beautiful garment of righteousness. His life is your life. It's perfect. It's already been lived victoriously. It is yours. Just receive it as a gift. Surrender yourself to Him and He will work out His plan in your life and then the Holy Spirit will be poured out on you and then He will mature that fruit and someday you will look back and you won't even recognize yourself. Amen. And when we get to heaven, we'll recognize each other, but we'll be a lot. Uh, I'll be able to lift a little more weight than I do. <laughs> I'll be able to run a little faster than I do. And some of you also are looking forward to that day, huh? Sometimes our landing gear, you know, you kneel down and you try to get up real fast and, and the landing gear doesn't unfold very fast. <laughs> I remember our next division president, he came and prayed with us. He was encouraging us at Mission Aviation and he knelt down and we all prayed together and then he couldn't get up. And so we lifted him up off the ground and his landing gear went... And all the hydraulics began to work slowly. <laughs> and he said, he was a pilot himself, and he said, my landing gear doesn't work. Well, guess what? In heaven, we're going to have new landing gear. <laughs> I'm so encouraged. Can we kneel down together and pray together and just turn our lives over to the Lord? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask my wife to come. Come just to kneel with me up here. My best friend ever since I was three years old. <laughs> I proposed to her when I was eight, and we've been flying together, working for the Lord this whole time. And so I thank you, Becky. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the beautiful gift, the garment that you have prepared for us. 
you have a crown prepared for you said you said hang on to what you have that no man take your crown mm -hmm. we have to hang on we can't be discouraged or give up but that courage and that enthusiasm comes from heaven we receive it as a gift lord difficult days are ahead but the best days of the church are straight ahead days of victory days of conquest days of soul searching not easy days but victorious days why do we know that is because you never fail and we place our lives in your hands we place our ministry we place our talents our skills our resources our time our appetite <laughs> All our problems we also place in your hands. You can deal with them because we can't. We have debts. We have family issues. We have sin issues. We have all kinds of issues that need to be dealt with. We just give you all of them. You are able to deal with all of them. Lord, we just come to you and we rest in that beautiful peace that you promise. That you promised in John 14, 27, not as the world giveth, I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. My peace I do give unto you. Lord, we receive it tonight. We thank you for those promises. The guarantee is in the word itself. You said it, we believe it, and that's good enough for us. Thank you, Lord. Tonight, anoint every family here, every single person. You know our hearts, you know where we live, you know our family situations, you know our life situations. You lived it. Of course you know it. You lived our life. You know everything. So, Lord, thank you for living our life in complete victory. We accept it tonight. Accompany us every day. May we renew our commitment every day. Live in us and use us to win our family members, our children, maybe uncles and aunts, maybe brothers and sisters, maybe spouses, our, our dear neighbors, our dear church family. We just place ourselves in your hands and we thank you and bless Steps to Life, Lord, and we thank Steps to Life for, in each of the personnel for bringing speakers on a regular basis that can help encourage us. Be with your wonderful church, your lovely church, the, the, the apple of your eye, the church and its mission that we may accomplish that for which we were here on, brought, and for which we were born and brought to this such a time as this. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' precious and beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen.